welcome to the Alex Salmon Show from the wonderful Regent's Park or Central Mosque here in London. After a month of fasting as Ramadan 2018 approaches its end and more than 150,000 Muslims will have prayed here over this month and Eid celebrations are being planned, we look at what it means and its importance to Muslims around the world. As we talk to International Aid Agency Islamic Relief, Lord Nazir Ahmed and Baroness Uden. We also turn to the issue of Islamophobia as tensions continue to mount since Home Secretary Sajid Javid escalated a row with the Muslim Council of Britain after he rejected their call for an independent inquiry into allegations of Islamophobia within the Conservative Party. And we speak to Tory peer Lord Sheikh, who has also called on Number 10 to address this matter of grave concern. But first, over to Alex with your tweets, your messages and your emails. Well, first up this week is a message from CRN Bob, who says, I'm glad there are still civilised people like you and Ian, Alec. Well, Bob, we do our absolute best on this show to raise the tone. And now a few messages about our series on shipbuilding. Paul Gogan says, should be resurrecting the Glasgow shipyards and those at Newcastle. Craig Dempsey adds, great show this week. Very interesting views on Scottish shipbuilding. After India, once again, become a world leader. And Morag Branson adds, another great programme discussing the precarious shipbuilding in Scotland and the UK, with mixed messages from ministers and from May. What interested me about the series we've done in shipbuilding is the absolute loyalty and commitment of the communities we, we focused on, those in Belfast and Recife and on the Clyde, to their shipyards and their determination to keep them as part of the future, not just part of an industrial heritage. And finally this week from Nelson Kerr who says, Tasmina looked a wee bit cold today despite her cardi. Give the lassie a warm vest. Well, I'll tell you what, Nelson, no need for warm vests today. And now back to Tasmina, who's at the Regents Park Mosque. A senior Conservative peer who served as an advisor to former Prime Minister David Cameron has written to Theresa May, backing calls for an inquiry into Islamophobia within the party, describing it as a matter of grave concern to the many Muslim members and supporters of the party. These claims are backed up by former Tory chairperson Baroness Warsi, who says it is a simmering anti-Muslim underbelly of Islamophobia within the party. Alex now speaks. To Lord Sheikh. Lord Sheikh, welcome to the, the Alex Salmon Show. Now, you are the, the first Conservative Muslim member of the, the House of Lords, but recently you've written to the Prime Minister expressing your concern about Islamophobia within the party. What provoked you to do that? Unfortunately, I believe that Islamophobia does exist now within the Conservative Party. I've tried to deal with the matter quietly by writing to the present Prime Minister, to the previous Prime Minister, as well as have spoken to the CCHQ. But unfortunately, we have not received the right reply, and no positive action has been taken. I believe that the party should accept that there is a problem, and let's come off this high horse of the denial. And I feel first thing the party should do is to accept that there's a problem and let's then have it properly examined, have an inquiry led by perhaps a retired judge, an AQC, and not only interview parliamentarians, but also interview members of the party from the ground, because I think we need to establish the extent of the problem. Now, over the, during the month of April and May, 19 members of the Conservative Party were either expelled or suspended because of the unsavory remarks they made regarding the Muslims. Last Friday, two Conservative councillors were suspended because of remarks which they made about the Muslim. There was a councillor in Barnet and a councillor in Suffolk. So there is a problem. And I think the answer is, let's examine it. And then having examined it, let us see what the solutions are. I care about the party. I'm not here to kick the party unnecessarily. So it's not one or two instances you're talking about. Yes. You see a series of yes. instances yes. which haven't been, in your estimation, properly tackled by the Conservative Party. They have been tackled. It's like, you know, sort of, trying to, these people have either been expelled or suspended. Has the Prime Minister, or indeed the 
Home Secretary responded to your concerns directly? My letter was sent last Friday to the Prime Minister. Uh, it, I went public on it. The reason I went public on it was prior to my letter, there, was, there were a lot of articles in newspapers, but so far I've had no response. Now, in an interview a week past, the Home Secretary seemed to dismiss concerns from the Muslim Council of Britain, similar concerns to yours. Were you surprised to see such a dismissive attitude to what you believe is a, a real problem? I'm not here to criticise the Home Secretary. He's a Muslim like me. But I think let's be realistic about it. And I feel that let us then look at the issue, look at the problem and find the answers. Now you've been joined in your criticism by Baroness Varsi, a former chair of the, the party. Yes. Do you not believe that, with, given that the, I think there are perhaps just a dozen Muslim members of the House of Lords, given the significance, and you being the first Muslim appointed to the House of Lords by the Conservative Party, you would expect to see a, a reaction to this statement at the highest level? Well, let us see how the Prime Minister responds. Uh, responses to my, my to what I have said. Of course, it requires active participation by the chairman of the party, and I think really that's what it needs. It needs the chairman. It needs the also uh, support from the association of various constituencies up and down the country. Do you think there's a, a parallel that you see in terms of the the party's unwillingness as yet to act? and what happened uh, with anti-Semitism complaints within the Labour Party, where it seemed to take the Labour Party a long time to get to grips with the issue. Are you frightened that the Conservative Party will have the same experience over Islamophobia? I am totally against any form of discrimination. I am patron of six organisations because I actively participate in interfaith dialogue. I believe that there must be harmony between all the communities. We're reaching the end of Ramadan. Do you have a message for the Muslim community worldwide? I, I like the month of Ramadan. It enables me to discipline myself. It's not very easy to fast in this country during the months of May and June, but denying the food is good for the mind and good for the body. Fasting is one of the pillars of Islam. Now, we would be celebrating Eid, depending on the f sighting of the moon. It's a great occasion. It's an occasion when families get together and they go to the mosque and say their prayers and they hug each other. They hug each other because they're very, very happy. So I would like to wish all your viewers, and don't forget, there are over a billion Muslims mm. in this country, in Central Asia, in Russia even. There are a lot of Muslims. Even at one time, the Tsar actually thought of becoming a Muslim. I don't know whether you know this story, but he said well, we when, he found out, <laughs> when he found out that drinking alcohol is prohibited, the Tsar changed his mind and decided to remain a Christian. So I'd like to wish everybody in every part of this global world of ours, enjoy your fasting. I mean enjoy, good for the mind. And of course, enjoy the festival of Eid. So I'd like to wish everybody Happy Ramadan, uh, Ramadan Mubarak, and of course, happy Eid al-Fitr when this occurs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Lord Sheikh. And now over to Tasbina, who's been interviewing Baroness Uden, who is the first female Muslim member of the House of Parliament. Baroness Uden, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. It's lovely to have you on. Now, you are the first woman Muslim peer in the House of Lords. And it's been 20 years, I think, since you first entered the House of Lords. What's it like? Thank you very much. It's a real, you know, a real pleasure to be here. Um, real good to see you. If you'd asked me 20 years ago, I think I would probably say exactly the same thing. Um, it's a, it's a great platform for myself as a, an activist. It's a great platform for continuing the work that I did for 20 years before I came into the House of Lords. Uh, but it's been challenging from day one. So, Baron Asudin, you speak of challenges, and of course you must mean that as a woman and also as a Muslim uh, in Parliament. When you talk about that, what, what do you mean? I think the challenges, various aspects of the challenges have increased or have taken different shape over the years. I think the very first time 
I came in, um, uh, I was the first, I think, youngest woman to have a baby. So like the very first day I came in, I hadn't seen my um, eight month old son for nearly 12 hours. You remember the house used to sit very, very long hours. And I, my husband and my family brought him in to see me just for a few minutes. And uh, whilst I did my motherly duty and fed him in the women's room, it was in those days, it used to be called the uh, Marshall room. Lo behold, I appear and uh, not to mention any newspapers that are, you know, sort I of think we can guess which ones yes, they are. I think we can. <laughs> and I appeared saying, what on earth is this woman has to offer to Parliament? So I think that pretty much set the tone. And I think that, you know, Muslim women like us who have opinions, who are rooted in the community, who will have fought Islamophobia, you know, long before it was called so, mm -hmm. racism in every name, in whichever guise it has appeared. I've been an advocate against, um, uh, you know, the war against Iraq. Uh, both myself and uh, Alex and Jeremy, we were in the front uh, at the, you know, in, in the march. So all those things, all the combination makes it very difficult. There is this, this feeling, this almost uh, incumbent upon Muslim yes. women just to keep going. Yes. But it doesn't mean to say it's difficult. Don't you have moments when you wonder why you're doing all of this, why you feel like you're fighting the world, sometimes to no avail? Well, I, I don't want to say that what are the choices? There are such a handful of us uh, in the public arena. I mean, Labour Party, whose record is outstanding on, you know, empowerment of women within the political process, has been desperately miserable um, in in all parts of the houses. If you, you know, within the political system, it hasn't enabled enough Muslim women to get selected. And certainly, you know, we're all appointed. It's the easiest thing in the world to do. But there hasn't been one more Muslim woman added on our benches. And I think at the moment, Tories have more Muslim women than on our benches. And it's, I think, an absolute tragedy. And I, I feel really sad about you know, my political party that I have devoted my entire adult life since the age of 16, that can't see itself to being as equal as it, you know, advocates for mm. others. I suppose whatever the arena might be, you know, having more women in that arena isn't just good for women, it's good for society as a whole. I think this is something we need to make more clear to people. There seems to be a lack of understanding in that respect. I, I think it's a must. I mean, surely we become... Um, I mean, it's incredulous, really, that we would ask anyone to accept as a political system um, with credibility if we don't have women. I mean, it just, it just belies any belief. I can't wait for my granddaughter, who is two, her generations to be frustrated as I am today with a country, in essentially, as a Muslim woman. I think Britain, you will know this, you travel like I have to so many parts of the world. It's one of the best places to be a Muslim woman, but not in the political uh, platform, not in a political um, arena, not in the private sector, not in any of the decision-making places where decision gets made about our lives. Very, very inspiring by Nasir Dunya. You must Thank inspire you. a lot of young women to come um, into the political As arena. You did. As but you I want did. to speak to you about Ramadan because we are, inshallah, almost at the end of it. Of yes. course, I spend most of my time in Scotland, so our fasts are at least an hour longer than in London, about quarter past ten now. But your thoughts and feelings about this year's Ramadan, have you enjoyed it as much as I have? Yes, Ramadan Kareem to everyone. Ramadan Mubarak and um, inshallah Eid Mubarak if the, this comes out before Eid. And I wish everyone well. Please remember us uh, and our family in your prayers. And we should also say that amongst those non-Muslims uh, amongst us, of which there are many, I find a real sense of understanding and respect for the fact yes. that we are not eating and drinking. People yes. won't eat and drink in front of us. Yes. And I think that's part of the diverse society yes. in which we live and we should, we should absolutely celebrate I, that I, as we celebrate the opening of our fast. Alhamdulillah, I have to say this, that, and I have definitely witnessed many, many more men and women asking about Ramadan and what it's like. And as a result, it makes the 12 hours, 15 hours, 18 hours much more easy much to Much more bear. bearable. <laughs> yes. Well, and you've been yes. a fantastic guest. It's been lovely Thank to you. have you. And when it comes, wishing you, your family, your loved ones a very happy Eid Mubarak. Eid Mubarak to you and all your viewers. Thank you so much. Coming up after the break, Alex speaks to Lord Nazir Ahmed on his thoughts and reflections on the holy month of Ramadan. And I'm delighted to be joined by Lord Ahmed the longest serving Muslim member 
of the House of Lords. Lord Ahmed, it's 20 years since you were appointed as the first Muslim peer. Now, in the House of Commons, where I was for a few years, you have to attend prayers to reserve your seat, which always struck me as very curious. But you don't have anything like that in the House of Lords, do you? But you know, Alex, what we did, on the first day that I entered the House of Lords, I asked for a prayer room. So we have a prayer room with evolution facilities. Uh, so as well as having my own little prayer room in my office, uh, there's a prayer room in the House of Lords where some of our staff, actually, the House of Lords staff can go and pray as well. You know, that only came about because the... Uh, uh, authorities at the time when I entered said we don't have a spare room this is an old building we can't create a, a prayer room and so I said well if I'm an equal member of the House of Lords then when their lordships and the bishops are praying every day can I stand in the corner and do my Muslim prayer <laughs> and they said no no we'll get, we'll get you a little room and substantial progress was made the concept of of giving uh, is central to the the, the holy month Hey, your international aid works well known. Do you think that Ram and Am is a huge boost for the, the funds of the, the various charities working in international aid? Actually, um, Muslims are the biggest donors for charity. And if you look at this month, they raise anything like £100 million uh, for various causes from Africa to Palestine to Rohingya communities to Kashmir to Syria and Iraq and all those people in Yemen and those who are suffering. Now Lord Abin, have you a, a message for the Muslim communities worldwide? It's, a, it's been a beautiful month where we had unity. For the first time, uh, Saudi Arabia, Britain, Pakistan and many other countries started the Ramadan on the same day. I hope that we can keep this unity when it comes to our political issues, whether it is Palestine, Kashmir, whether it is uh, uh, Syria or Yemen. We need to have that unity to resolve some of our difficult problems. Lord Ahmed, thank you so much. And now over to, to Tasmina. I'm joined by Simina Huck, Head of Programs at Islamic Relief, and Sadia Sajid, Challenges and Events Coordinator. Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you for having now, us. Now we are hopefully, perhaps, on the last day of Ramadan with an expectation, although not necessarily the case, that Eid might be tomorrow, inshallah. Yeah. I'm really keen for our viewers to understand, Sadi, if I may come to you yeah. first, a bit about what Ramadan is all about and why we do what we do during this holy month. Okay, so Ramadan is one of the most holiest months for Muslims around the world. And it, actually, the, the literal meaning of Ramadan is to like the burning, which means like the, it's, it's a symbol of the purification that we're going through, so the purification of ourselves. So similarly, like where you have gold and it's purified through the process of you know, burning and refining and purifying, similarly, we view Ramadan as a similar process where you're refining ourselves and you're purifying ourselves. And you're kind of stripping back all of our uh, wants and desires to do the best that we can in the, in the ways that God has asked us to do. So abstaining from food so that we can appreciate food better, abstaining from water so that we can appreciate the value of water better, uh, abstaining from you know being even cruel to anyone or saying the wrong word to someone or rising to our own anger if someone's upsetting us. All of those things are the things that we have to try and control during the month of Ramadan. And we also tend to take that month um, as a month of really exceeding in good deeds because we believe that the rewards are manifold, uh, re uh, amplified in, Ram in Ramadan. So everything that we do, we feel like the rewards are so much more greater in this month. So we kind of ex excel in trying to do good deeds throughout this month. I think it's probably fair to say that yeah. everybody probably knows somebody yeah. um, who is fasting during this month. And the question that we're so often asked is, but what, no water, no, no fluids <laughs> either. Uh, how, how do you respond to that? Um, I think it's one of those things where we... You know, there are people who are able-bodied, who are fit and able, can, and, and we have it proven that we can actually do this fast. So, like I said, it's a purification, it's a month of purification, and it's a spiritual purification, but it's also a physical purification as well. So, Samina, if I can talk to you about some of the, sure. the, the programmes that Islamic Relief um, undertakes. Yeah. There are many and varied, yeah. not just in Muslim countries, but above yeah. and beyond. You did a lot in Grenfell, for instance. Yes, can you course. tell me a bit about what you have ongoing at the moment? Yeah, so, um, obviously, through Ramadan, our biggest programme uh, in this particular period will be... Um, feeding the 
poor and um, impoverished families all, all across the world. So we do food pack distributions, um, and what we will ensure is that those food packs that we distribute, they will have a, a particular cal calorific value. So we'll make sure that they've got protein, they've got sugar, they've got fat, they've got carbohydrates, so that people uh, in the, around the world who you know some of the poorest people that we're working with, and we can empathise with them because they actually where we don't have access to food and water during Ramadan, these people actually don't have access to food and water most of the time. Mm. Um, and I mean, we've, we've had Oxfam on, we've had UNHCR yeah. on, you know, there's various agencies and, and charities that, that are working yeah. uh, across lots of different areas and where you can work together. It's obviously hugely beneficial, but Sadi, I know yeah. you are in charge of events and challenges. Yes. And uh, let me know what the challenges part of that means. Okay, so challenges is uh, fundraising initiatives that are set up where there is a challenge element involved. So a lot of people are quite keen to exert themselves and push themselves, you know, out of their comfort zone. And, you know, they want to do it for a good reason, for a good cause. So for me, that's the most valuable part of this whole thing. But for the person who signs up, they get to have an experience like no other. So for example, I will take them to Kilimanjaro to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, or I'll take them to uh, Everest and we'll climb up to base camp um, in You've Everest. You've done all of these things? I you? have, yes. <laughs> like a couple of years ago, I mean, I challenged myself as well, because mountains have been my thing for a while. So Snowdon and Ben Nevis, etc. Oh, those are our yeah. things. But, you must um, have spent some time in Scotland. I have, right yes. Ben Nevis is amazing. Um, but like, I've never cycled before, ever. But I spent one afternoon learning how to cycle, and then I did a, a cycle across Andalusia, which was really exciting. So we're hoping to do another one in Turkey, so we're going to cycle across Turkey. And That's if you're fantastic. not a cyclist, it's really quite painful. But that, that whole thing is such an experience, and people will sponsor you, and they'll hopefully hear about this Water for Life project that we're fundraising for. And again, it's a long-term sustainable project for And me. awareness raising, of it's, course, is hugely really important. important. Well, thank you both very much, you're and welcome. inspiring to speak to you both. <laughs> Lovely to see women in power, and they've taken over the board at Islamic Relief, <laughs> is always a good story and I wish you all inshallah when it comes a very very happy Eid with your family and loved Thank ones you. and I only wish we could we could spread the joy and enjoy what we're going to have across the world there are so many people who will be suffering when we'll be able to enjoy that day but thank you very much indeed for all that you do thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. now over to Alex who's back in the studio and joined by the UK director of Islamic Relief Imran Madden thank you Tasmina Imran welcome to the Alex Salmon show thank you now it must be a very but obviously Ramadan is a holy month for, for all Muslims, but it must be a very busy month for the UK's leading Muslim charity. Well, I think most people know that Ramadan is a month of fasting, so they're probably aware that during daylight hours from sunrise to sunset, we, we don't drink, we don't eat. Uh, that's part of the, the conditions of the fast. Uh, but well, hence no water for you. Yeah, I, I didn't want to have any glass case people think just I was being rude. <laughs> <laughs> no, just in case I reach for it, we, we, we can make that mistake. Mm. Um, but what's less well known is that it's also the month of giving. Mm. So uh, one of the five pillars uh, is zakat. It's, it's a charitable contribution from your income. It's two and a half percent of your expendable income. Uh, and for, for loads of different reasons, usually connected to the concept of greater reward. Uh, most Muslims leave contributing their charitable donations until the month of Ramadan. So we receive, in the space of maybe five or six weeks, uh, half of our annual income. So it's a, it's a very, very busy period. Um, now, when I was first minister in Scotland, I, I came across one of the project proposals that Islamic Relief really came to us with was microfinance for, for women. I think it was mm -hmm. in Pakistan. It was, Which yeah. struck me as a, a very interesting concept. Was that really a, a lot behind that in terms of the power it has to, mm -hmm. to, to change uh, relationships and, and communities? Yeah, I think microfinance, I mean, it's well publicised. I mean, uh, interventions at a community level. Uh, often with very small contributions. I mean, it's not about providing thousands of pounds to an individual. It's often loans of the equivalent of, say, 50 pounds, 100 pounds, 200 pounds, which makes an incredible difference to, say, a widow who's trying to, you know, feed her kids, uh, trying to develop her business, but just needs that extra cash to, to, to buy a few more utensils so that she can produce a bit more food, for example. And you know, you've had a, a distinguished career in, the, in the, the giving sector, international support and aid sector. Can, what, what would you say that Islamic Relief's uh, unique giving point is? I mean, what, what is the, the thing that you think that Islamic Relief does perhaps best uh, of, of the range of charities? I would say our reach. I mean, I, I would emphasize that we have that portfolio, including developmental work. But I'd have to say at the moment, given the nature of the world, how many conflicts there are, especially in places like the Middle East, it's our reach, it's our ability to underline our humanitarian credentials, to prove to the communities, to sometimes the armed groups, sometimes the local government, that we're here for the right reasons 
uh, we're here to support based on need. Uh, and we spend a lot of time talking to communities. So what that means is, uh, even after several months, we're able to get access to some of the almost beyond reach communities. Uh, and they're often in conflict zones. So we have incredibly brave aid workers, men and women, uh, who are often volunteers, um, who do that community negotiation. And in places like Yemen, Syria, Iraq, we're often the only aid agency in a particular area. But just to clarify, your reach is not restricted to Muslim communities? Not at all, no. Um, I mean, we're faith inspired. I mean, I think we'd underline, for reasons connected to you know, charitable giving, um, that the community is very, is very generous. In, in, in Ramadan uh, alone in the UK, we raise over 100 million within all the Muslim charities. So it's a very generous community. So some of the largest natural disasters in recent years, Haiti, the earthquake in Haiti, Philippines earthquake, uh, the super typhoon in the Philippines, you probably remember. These are all non-Muslim countries, but we've had significant interventions. They've been some of our biggest humanitarian programs over the last five years. So I think that goes to show that we perhaps, you know, now reached a stage where people are asking that question a bit less, that they've seen this in different places of the planet. They understand it's about our faith motivating our interventions, but ultimately we're blind to issues of, you know, race and, and colour and creed, etc. Limran, as I've said to other agencies in the international development sector, more power to your elbow. Now, you I, I can't give you a 50 pence, <laughs> uh, but what I can do is give you the, the Alex Salmon quick. Well, that's fantastic. Now, I don't know if you know the drill in this. This is a Gaelic, a Scots Gaelic for uh, a loving cup. Uh, and, and normally, normally it's whiskey that goes into the loving cup, but, but you know, other drinks are available. But if I remember right, Iron Brew is a typical I, of I've yours. been partial to Iron Brew. Well, yes. once Ramadan is over, it's Iron Brew and I shall drink. passed around only your close And remember friends. you, Alex. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for the interview. Thank you. The month of Ramadan is the holiest month in the Islamic calendar, where Muslims all around the world will fast from sunrise to sunset. And at the end of every fast, we'll share food with the family and friends, and especially the poor. It's also a month for giving to charity. But as we reach the end of Ramadan and look forward to the celebrations that Eid will bring, we of course will always remember those who are less well off and facing many more challenges than we do here in this country. In our special programme on Holocaust Memorial Day, we heard how education was crucial to creating the understanding to allow us to tackle the, the evil of anti-Semitism. In this programme, We've heard from Lord Sheikh calling for an inquiry in the Conservative Party into the growing problem of Islamophobia. And Lord Sheikh said that education was crucial and things shouldn't be treated as isolated instance. Now, the Conservative Party haven't responded to a request for them to give us uh, a statement. But nonetheless, the Prime Minister would be well advised to listen to the senior Conservative Muslim peer. He does know what he's talking about. So from all of us here, on the Alex Salmon Show. Until we see you next week from us, it is Eid Mubarak. Mubarak.